Um, Kristen, can you turn off your camera too? And then turn it back on when. Not on mine because I have I have the big screen now showing. Do you know what I mean? Oh, now it's off. I don't know how that happened. Did you do it? Vicky, do you want to open the room if you haven't already? Hey everyone coming in. Uh, we are just going to wait a couple more minutes for um, a couple people, you know, if there are any late joiners, and then we'll start. So thank you for joining us. We're just going to give people one more minute to log in. Twelve. Thank you for attending or coming today. All right, let's get started. We're excited that you joined us this afternoon. Welcome to our report launch webinar and virtual panel discussion for Del Norte and Mendocino uh, County Spotlights. My name is Alex Powers, I work with Measure of America. And before I turn things over to Lisa Carreño, President and CEO of the United Way of the Wine Country, Michelle Rich, Director of Community Impact for the Community Foundation of Mendocino County, and Tiffany Gibson, Director of Wellbeing for Adventist Health. To commence our welcoming remarks, I'd just like to review a couple of housekeeping items. So today's webinar and discussion is scheduled for 90 minutes, ending at 1.30 p.m. Pacific time, and the session is being recorded. The audience will be in a listen-only mode. However, we encourage you to submit questions for speakers throughout the session as you think of them by clicking on the Q&A link, which should be at the bottom of your screen. Our speakers will address as many questions as time permits. Now I'm going to turn things over to Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, Alex, for the introduction. Um, I My video is stopped, so let me just, uh, with audio, uh, welcome you and thank everybody who has joined today's meeting. I especially want to thank um, United Way's funding partners um, in this endeavor, um, funders from Del Norte County and from um, Mendocino County, I especially want to um, express sincere thanks to Measure of America um, for partnering with us on this uh, effort to assess the Human Development Index in both Mendocino County and Del Norte County. Um, we know that um, that things that are important to us only count when we really dive into analyzing and seeing and understanding what's happening. And to have a deeper understanding of the Human Development Index in Mendocino and Del Norte County is going to help all of us. Um, people in the third sector, like me, who are working in philanthropy and with nonprofits to fund the work, um, to support the community, to invest in equity building, and decision makers in public uh, sector uh, leadership um, to help define policies and resource allocation means and methods uh, to better meet the needs of the community. So um, this is, I, I think, a groundbreaking bit of work and I am very grateful um, that our partners um, in funding saw the priority of investing in this as we did. 
So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Tiffany uh, first and then to Michelle to also welcome everybody to this meeting. Thank you, Lisa. And um, I really want to thank the United Way of Wine Country uh, for working with this project and the Measure of America team. Uh, the work that you have put into creating the spotlight for Mendocino County is so appreciated and so valuable. The things that really stand out to me is really the emphasis on people and the focus on inclusion and really bringing all that data together in a way that's really accessible to a wide range of people. This is gonna be such a valuable tool to all of our community-based organizations as they plan their future impact strategies. So a huge honor to be a part of this and happy to be here today and so thankful for all of you who are joining. Thank you, Tiffany. So I want to echo my colleagues and welcome everyone here today. Thank you for taking the time to dive into the data. And while we will be looking at data for our county today and for Del Norte, um, I feel like it's essential to ground that data in the landscape uh, of our counties, the beautiful redwoods, mountains, and oceans um, that make Mendocino County and Del Norte such a unique and wonderful places to live. And I do want to take a moment to recognize um, that Mendocino County is located on the present and ancestral homeland and unseceded territory of the Pomo people, the Coast Yuki, the Yuki, Haknom, Sikyoni, Wailaki, and Caddo people. I want to honor those tribes who were brought to Mendocino County without choice and are now part of the Round Valley Indian tribes, including Pitt River, Nomlaki, and Konkal people. And I include this acknowledgement because it offers a context for the story that Mendocino Ga County's data tells. And I know the true, that same is true of Del Norte County. And what that data tells us is that it's a harder place to live than California as a whole from the perspective of the Human Development Index measures. We have significant racial and ethnic disparities that are linked to the ongoing effects of the historical trauma experienced in our communities. And these is disparities affect every aspect of life here, economy, education, and health. For us as a foundation, as we consider how to move the needle on these disparities, we start our work with both the connection to the community, which I appreciate Tiffany highlighting, but also with what the data tells us about our communities. From there, we can be strategic in our grant making, community leadership, partnerships, and donor engagement work. The Portrait of California, and more specifically the Spotlight on Mendocino County, are very valuable tools to help us do our work better because they help us understand community experiences in a more nuanced way and validate what we hear directly from our communities. With that said, I'll turn things over to Kristen Lewis, Measure of America's co-founder and director, to present the key findings from both reports. Great. Thank you so much. Let me just... Um get my video working, start video, okay, sorry, all these techno technological things are always um, a little bit of a challenge, okay, here we go, okay. all right, I think all is in order, does everyone see the agenda there, yes, and can everyone hear me? Okay, so great. Um, so again, I just wanted to first of all um, thank thank everyone for their for their kind welcoming remarks. Um, really appreciate the support that um, all of you and your organizations have shown us in this process, um, and uh, particularly, of course, to these organizations that have um, provided funding for the report. So um, I'm just going to, for about half an hour or so, um, go through um, our findings, and I'll just do a very brief introduction. Most of you know all about this already, but just in case you don't. Um, Measure of America has been working in California uh, for over a decade now. We've had three reports on, on California as a whole, um, and we have various tools and things like that. So we, we feel it's our, our second home, our virtual home <laughs> in many ways. 
Um, this project um, is part of the Portrait of California 2021-2022, which we released toward the end of last year. In addition to the reports, the spotlights on Del Norte and Mendocino, we also had reports on um, the Inland Empire, Sonoma County, and we'll be releasing another report um, in a few months time on the San Joaquin Valley. So just to really quickly um, remind you of our sort of conceptual framework, we um, everything we do is under this umbrella of human development, which is an alternative to money metrics like GDP. It was developed at the United Nations in the late uh, 1980s as a way to measure progress and well-being in countries around the world using something that was more complicated and complex and, and better reflected um, people's lives than, than simple money metrics. Um, so instead of asking how is the economy doing like GDP does, um, the measure of America and human development approaches um, more broadly ask how people are doing. So this idea of human development is really about uh, the real freedom ordinary people have to decide how to live, you know, who to be, what to do, um, how to run their life in a sense. Um, we all have a lot of theoretical, theoretical freedoms in the United States, um, but in terms of real freedoms to imagine our future lives and make them come true, um, th those freedoms are not um, really available to everyone in the same sorts of ways. our access to the natural world. And it's hard to measure all of those things. So the human development is of value and a decent standard of living. So um, you'll see that the presentation I'm about to give will really focus on these three areas. Um, a long and healthy life, we use um, life expectancy at birth as the proxy. For access to knowledge, we use degree attainment for all adults age 25 and up, and school enrollment for young people age three, four. Living the proxy is median personal earnings, which is the wages and salaries of all workers 16 and above. Many people ask if we adjust the cost, adjust for cost of living. We don't because there's not really a well-recognized and uh, good formula for doing that that doesn't introduce a lot of distortion. So um, we don't adjust for cost of living. You may also notice that some of these figures seem very low. Two reasons for that. One is that they are personal earnings, so uh, the salaries of an individual, not the salaries of a household. Uh, another reason is it's median earnings, not average earnings. And the third reason is that a lot of the salaries are actually extremely low. So that's another reason. So to create the index, which I'll be talking about, we take these three areas, we add them together, divide by three, and we get a number that's, that falls on the scale from zero to 10, 10 being high, zero being low. So just to put it in context, California as a whole has an index score of 5.85. So there are some important limitations and caveats um, to the data I'm about to present. And I'm just gonna invite my colleague, um, Rebecca, to just go through them a bit. She's a, a certified statistician, so she can uh, talk about this better and she can also answer your questions during uh, the presentation in the chat function. Hi everyone, um, Rebecca Gluskin, nice to meet everyone. Um, so I just wanted to go over some important limitations to the data that we use. So all of our data comes from both the census and the Centers for Disease Control. And because these are very reliable, um, robust data sets, they also do come with some limitations because they're collecting data for hundreds of years and for millions of people. Um, they've been set and very regimented for a long time. So the data are not available, unfortunately, for all groups, um, mostly due to population size um, and also opportunities to identify in these surveys, which are fairly rigid and structured um, so that they can be measured over time, but they're also a little slow to change with the time. So 
um, some of the categories are a bit old. Um, some of the data presented are less reliable. Um, and we, we say that with like a, with a caveat in that it's still data that we can use for program planning, for nonprofit use, for, um, for applying for resources. But if we were doing like a, a thesis study on <laughs> logistic regressions, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't use the data for like a, an academic research project, but I think they're really important to use for um, program planning and for resource allocation. Um, as you know, many Native Americans um, identify as Native American in a survey, but then also plus another race um, in the census surveys. Just, this is really just how the census is structured. Um, but this results in Native American undercounts because um, then they are placed sometimes into a category that has multiple race and ethnicity. So it could be an other category, it could be one or two or more races, um, but it does lead to um, a challenge in getting in, in the numbers that are identifying as Native American only. Um, we also come across a challenge with gender categories um, in almost all of our data the only two categories available in the data that we receive are male and female. Although I do wanna say that the US chief statistician just announced that they are reconsidering these categories for gender um, for future studies. So that is um, how progress moves at the federal level. It, it takes a while, but um, hopefully we'll have new categories in the future. Um, and we understand that encountering this data can be difficult. Um, it is hard to look at these statistics and then also understand what's happening on the ground. Um, so they are summary, summary level data. They don't always translate exactly to people's real world experiences, but they are a bird's eye view of what's going on in the region. It's not an individual um, account for everyone. Um, and then we're mindful of critiques about how current data norms, languages and practices can be harmful. Um, and we always wanna be open to growing and learning with every group that we work with. Thank you so much, um, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So Okay. All right, I think I'm unmuted now. Okay, so I will start with Mendocino County and then I will go to Del Norte County and I'll stop for questions in the middle. Um, so here we go. Uh, let's see, so what we see here is the Human Development Index. So again, that's that um, big calculator we saw before. So the Human Development Index combines health, education and earnings indicators all into one. On this map and on all of the maps that you'll see today, darker colors represent higher scores. So, so um, they represent higher human development index scores. They represent longer lives, more education and higher earnings. So that will be consistent. Even though the colors will change, the darker shades um, are, are sort of higher scores or higher levels of well-being. Um, so the, the scores here in uh, Mendocino County range from 3.16 on the scale of 10, um, up to F10 to 6.74. And so you can see here on this map where those highs and lows um, are situated. Here, so we've we've created an index by um, by census tract, which is what you saw a moment ago, and then we also present the HDI by race, ethnicity, um, and gender. So here we see um, the under the gender column, we can see that women have higher score than men in general on, on the overall HDI index, four point six nine versus four point two six. And that's that's striking because though women live longer, um, you can see quite a, a big distance between women and men in terms of life expectancy and have much more education, a much, much higher education score uh, for women than men in Mendocino County, uh, women still earn less than men. So um, we'll talk about that more later on. In the county itself, um, Asian, res Asian residents of Mendocino have the highest score, 5.71 
followed by white residents, 5.37, Latino residents, 4.71, and Native American residents who have a score of 3.58. Um, there are too few uh, Black residents in Mendocino for us to calculate a reliable human development index, largely um, because we weren't able to calculate life expectancy for this group. We do have um, data on education and median earnings, however, so we can talk about that later. And for some groups, white, um, Latino, and Native American residents, we were also able to calculate a score um, by gender. And um, we see that for um, for all groups, um, no, I'm sorry, for white and Latinos, uh, women have a slightly higher score than their male counterparts. Um, whereas Native American men and women have very similar scores uh, with men scoring slightly higher. And again, there were too few um, Asian and black residents to um, calculate a disaggregation by race and ethnicity and gender. So now I'll just go through each of the three areas of the index, starting with a long and healthy life. So again, life expectancy in Mendocino County is 78.8 years. Um, that's less than the California average, uh, which is 81.1 years. And we see a range from a low of 74 years to a high of 85.3 years. So again, these are census tracts in Mendocino County. The higher um, life expectancies are, are denoted in that darker red and the lower levels of life expectancy in that sort of more salmon color. If we disaggregate by gender and race and ethnicity, we see a huge range um, from Native American men whose life expectancy at birth. So again, life expectancy at birth is how long a baby born today can expect to live if current patterns of mortality continue throughout his or her lifetime. So for Native American men, life expectancy is 70.2 years. That's you know 11 years less than for California as a whole. And it's considerably less than the life expectancy for, for Latina women, which is 89 years, over 89 years. So there's a, a huge variation. We, have, we do tend to see in California, Asian uh, residents living the longest, followed by Latino residents. Um, so this seeing these high life expectancy for Latina women is something we've seen in many parts of the state. Uh, you can see that, um, Latina women and Latino men have a, a fairly large gap between uh, their life expectancies, as do um, white women and white men. It's, it's quite a chasm there. And the life expectancy for Native American women and men is a bit closer, about five years. Five years is fairly typical um, for the life expectancy differences between um, women and men in the population as a whole. In terms of access to knowledge, here again, we see our, um, our map. So the education index for uh, Mendocino County is 4.75. Um, for the state as a whole, it's 5.45. So it's, it's a bit less than that, but we see quite a range from a high of five point of, sorry, from a high of 8.35, which is an extremely high score, um, down to uh, 3.02. And just to remind you of the components, so the education index is made up of four parts. Um, the share of adults who have um, at least a high school degree, at least a college degree and a graduate degree, and then combined with the share of the population between the ages of three and 24 who are enrolled in school. So it's looking at the educational outcomes um, that adults have already achieved, as well as sort of the, um, the future, <laughs> the who's in school now and, and um, at, at what ages. Here we see the education index, again, by gender and by race and ethnicity. Um, white residents have the highest, um, followed very closely by Asian residents. This is different from California as a whole, where Asian uh, residents have the highest score by a considerable margin. Um, Native Americans, uh, Black residents, and Latino residents um, come next. And you can see in this, this is a, um, if you haven't seen this kind of bar graph, it can be a little bit confusing at first, but it's a good way to look at how the population um, kind of chunks out, in, in how it is in big chunks. So you see about two thirds of white adults, their highest, um, their highest degree is, is high school diploma. Um, likewise, um, 
uh, Native American and Black adults, whereas for Asians, only 44 um, percent have as their highest degree high school diploma, whereas almost three in 10 have um, a college degree and 18% uh, have a graduate degree, which is very, very high. Um, for Latino residents, there, there you see about a third um, have less than high school, did not graduate high school. This is very much something that represents um, uh, a situation of sort of first generation. Many um, uh, immigrants to California uh, perhaps didn't have the educational opportunities that they would have liked to have in their home country. Maybe they weren't able to graduate high school. Now, so that's the case for Latinos, but the second generation, for instance, earns high school degrees at the same rate as um, the average Californian. So this is something that kind of you see, it's sort of the immigration story uh, for many, many groups in the United States over time. And now we'll just turn to decent standard of living. And here we have, again, the earnings. So just to put this in context, California as a whole, the median personal earnings are just shy of $40,000. Um, here in Mendocino, it's $28,500. Um, and there's a huge range from just a bit over $17,000 um, up to $35,900. And again, the very, very pale greens are the areas with the lowest earnings and um, the dark, the dark sort of evergreen color have the highest earnings. And I mentioned earlier the gender earnings gap. So here we see it represented. Um, so in Mendocino County as a whole, uh, that's under gender, that first column, but I'm sorry, that second set of columns shows the difference um, in earnings between women and men. Um, the earnings for women and men who are white are about the same, the, the earnings are a bit higher. Um, and then we basically we see this gap in all of the racial and ethnic groups, uh, the smallest among Asian residents of Mendocino County. And the reasons for that, you know, there are many reasons for this. Um, one is women are more likely than men to work part time. Um, the reason for that is, of course, greater uh, disproportionate uh, responsibilities for caretaking labor, taking care of kids, taking care of elderly relatives. There's a real penalty for motherhood in the labor market. So um, women and men tend to earn much closer uh, salaries uh, before they have children. Once people have children, men tend to earn a bit more. They kind of get a bonus for every child they have, whereas women take a pay, pay cut hit uh, for every child. There still exists wage discrimination, of course. And then women are concentrated in different sorts of jobs than men. And those jobs, because women are there, tend to pay less than um, jobs where men with similar educational um, credentials tend to have jobs. So a good example is home health care aid and um, parking attendants aid. Both have same sort of requirements for education, um, but parking attendants tend to make more than home health aides do. So um, as with all, our, all of our reports, we make a series of um, recommendations. These recommendations, um, some of them uh, came from our advisory panel, so that is great. Others came from processes that have already been taking place in Mendocino. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel, so um, where there are already surveys and, and recommendations, we tried to build, to build on those. And now I'll just break um, for questions about Mendocino, you can pop them in the chat or you can ask to, you know, you can unmute yourself and, and ask questions. No, you cannot. Okay, you have to just put them in the chat. Okay. Oops. We can, and also if there, do, are there any coming in the chat? I can't see because of my screen sharing. No, we don't have any questions just yet, Kristen. However, so I know another you another option is that. Oh, there's one. Here's one question. One thing. Okay, someone wants to know uh, where we can get the data. So we'll have a landing page for, um, or we do already have a landing page uh, for the Mendocino and Del Norte reports. 
and we'll have both reports will be there and um, you'll be able to download the data. We also have a little mapping tool so you can uh, map because it's a bit difficult to um, see where the highs and lows are just because it's um, for the map, especially because we've uh, presented it by census tracts, but of course no one knows, oh, I live in census tract 106. So it will allow you to hover your mouse over the places you wanna know about. It will tell you the census tract and then it will tell you also um, the score of the data that's underneath. So we'll have that. So if that's the only uh, question, I'll continue. And if you have other questions that occur to you, just pop them in the pop them in the chat, and we can answer as I'm going. So now I'll just turn to Del Nort, and um, we will see a similar sort of presentation as we did from Mendocino. So here we see the Human Development Index by Census Tract. Again, darker. Um, colors represent higher scores, lighter colors, lower scores. And it seems like, and for, for Del Nort, the spaces the, are much larger. That's because um, the census tracts tend to cover more ground in Del Nort, just because it's um, the population is less, less dense. So it ranges um, from a high of 5.38 um, in this area to a low of 2.56, which is an extremely low score. We see very few areas um, that have um, these outcomes, and that's just in the southern part of, of Crescent City. Here we see again uh, the Human Development Index by race, ethnicity, and gender. Uh, we see overall the pattern continuing of women having a high over, higher overall score 4.47 compared to men who score 3.83. Um, again, women have a longer life expectancy at birth, have more edu and have uh, higher levels of education, but earn more than um, their male counterparts. Um, the score for uh, white residents of Del Norte is 4.90, for Latino residents 4.60, and for Native Americans 2.38. Um, you'll notice again, there's an asterisk there. That's again, just to talk about what, what Rebecca had mentioned earlier, that you wouldn't use this for your statistics thesis. Um, the reliability wouldn't be sufficiently high, but for the purposes of planning and understanding, it, it gives us a good, a good indication. Um, and again, we see um, uh, white women and Latina women performing uh, better than their male counterparts. Um, including Latino women having a higher score than white men and um, Native American men doing slightly better uh, than their female counterparts. Again, this has to do mostly with the very low earnings of Native American women, $17,300. Um, now we'll turn to a long and healthy life. So life expectancy at birth in um, Del Norte County is 78.3 years. Um, and there's a range uh, from a high of 79.7 years, so almost 80, um, closer to the average for California, um, all the way down to 73.1 years. And again, you can see this area um, around Crescent City to its north and south uh, as having uh, quite low uh, life expectancy. Here we see those people on the line that we saw from Mendocino. And this shows um, everyone's uh, life expectancy at birth, all the groups for whom we were able to calculate life expectancy. Um, Del Norte is, uh, has shorter life expectancy than California as a whole. Uh, for all groups, we see uh, women outliving their male counterparts. Um, the lowest is um, the lowest life expectancy is Native American men at 71.4 years. And very close um, to that, is uh, Native American women at 73 years, which is um, a very unusually low life expectancy uh, for women of any race or ethnicity. Latino women are living the longest, almost 90 years in, in Del Norte on average. So, you know, as an average, that's pretty impressive. Now we're turning to access to knowledge. Again, our, our map of Del Norte County. The education index for Del Norte County is 3.50. Just to compare it to California as a whole, which is 5.45. Is, uh, so it's um, considerably less than the, state, than the state average. And we see a range 
from 1.62, uh, which is one of the lowest education index scores we've seen in our work, um, to 5.37 as a high. Here we see the breakdown by race, ethnicity, uh, by just, sorry, by just race and ethnicity. Um, we see that um, Asian residents have the highest score, um, followed by quite a large gap, and then white residents, Black residents, Latino residents, and Native American residents. Oh, just to go back, sorry. For Native American residents, it's, it's um, quite striking. There's a very high share of um, of adults whose highest degree is 80 is um is a high school degree um almost 83 percent um comparatively fewer going on um to college and graduate school but but not that many um uh, adults without a high school degree compared to say the rate for um, black or latino residents and now a decent standard of living mm -hmm. Oh, sure. That's a, a great question. There's a, it's a, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, we're all in the same room. So we're like whispering to each other also. Um, Alex was reading me the, the um, a question, what accounts for the longer life expectancy for Latinos? So this is something uh, that we've been investigating, noticing and investigating for some time. Uh, and other, other people have as well. So there are lots of scholars who are focused on this question. Um, it's called the Latino health paradox. So all around the world, um, groups where um, more adults have higher levels of education and where earnings are higher, those groups tend to have longer life expectancies than the groups with less education and lower earnings. However, in the United States, that doesn't seem to be the case. So um, as you'll remember from the education slide, uh, Latinos as a group tend to have lower levels of adult um, uh, educational um, attainment. And again, it has a lot to do with immigration and the chances people had available to them in their home country. Um, but despite that, despite the fact that these um, that Latinos have lower levels of education on average and earn less, they have the second longest life expectancy in California. Um, just just behind Asians and Latino women in particular. So there are a few hypotheses for this. Um, lots of them have been kind of disproven. They, they make sense on their surface. One is the healthy migrant theory or the healthy migrant hypothesis, which is that people who can undertake the rigors of moving to a new country, especially if they have to do so, do so um, uh, like crossing deserts and doing all of these um, unbelievably courageous and dangerous things, um, that only someone who's in good health would contemplate such a journey. Uh, that's one hypothesis. Another is that called the salmon hypothesis, which is that when people are ill, they go home to die, go to their home country if they're sick or, or you know, we want to die at home. Um, and so their deaths are not counted in the United States. So people have looked at these two topics. Neither, neither really um, has super strong evidence for it. Another hypothesis is the family cohesion and social support hypothesis. So there's a lot of evidence that um, birth outcomes for Latinas are very, very good, um, you know, compared to other racial and ethnic groups, even when earnings are kept the same. And the reason, uh, is, uh, researchers hypothesize, is that uh, Latina women get a lot of support um, from their families when they're pregnant, um, they're taken care of, there's a lot of um, cultural and social capital around, uh, you know, taking care of, of women who are pregnant and helping them navigate uh, early days of motherhood. So it's possible that that same kind of social cohesion and family support also affects other kind of health outcomes as well. So these are the theories. I'll just scooch back. So just to go back to this one, I don't know if we did this one yet, but these are, so this is median personal earnings, again, wages and salaries of all workers 16 and above. Uh, the median personal earnings are just a bit uh, north of $30,000, about $1,000 less than uh, the California median. And we see a range from uh, $17,900 um, all the way up to uh, 40,000, a bit over 40,000. And again, um, the lows are are here around uh, Crescent City, and then and then in this this other um, light area, light green area. 
here we see again the gender earnings gap. Uh, you'll notice that the gender earnings gap in Del Norte is smaller than the gender earnings gap in Mendocino, um, which is uh, interesting and noteworthy. Um, and it's not, it doesn't vary super widely by race and ethnicity. The gap is, is not that different um, by, by race and ethnicity, which is different from say California as a whole, where the white earnings gap is about $20,000. Um, and other earnings gaps are more like, like for um, black residents, I think it's more like five, $6,000. And again, same, same reasons. And again, you know, we made, um, we made uh, different recommendations for Del Norte, though some, some are the same. Um, we did make um, supporting the health and well-being of young mothers. Um, one of our uh, recommendations here, because uh, the rate of uh, birth to teen mothers is, is higher here than, than many other places. Um, likewise, the needs of at-risk young people, the youth disconnection rate in Del Norte is about 32% which is so um, that's teens and young adults 16 and to 24 who are neither working nor in school that's i think the second highest or highest um, rate among california counties so that's a, a real priority for the for the region so again just to open it up to questions and answers and before i pass it to our panelists i think i'll Okay. Hi, Kristen, we do have a question. Um, and it's yes. what accounts for the shorter life expectancy for Native American people? Are the same studies you talked about for Latinos? Oh, sure. So um, one of our questions well. was what accounts for the shorter life expectancies for Native American people and are similar studies being done? So um, there are similar studies being done. We have seen an actual drop in life expectancy among Native Americans in California in the 10 years uh, that we've been doing um, work in, in the state. So we, for us, we believe that all these differences go back to the social determinants of health. So, you know, I'm sure you all know this, the social determinants of health are the conditions people are born into um, and they are exposed to uh, when they're children, at school, when they're working, in their neighborhoods, and so forth. And um, Things that are good for your health, your social determinants of health are um, decent standard of living, you know, having enough money not, so you're not exposed to chronic stress, um, healthy communities where you can walk and exercise. Um, and so areas um, where people are deprived of opportunities for healthy choices, in a sense, um, tend to have lower uh, life expectancy. So. In most of the country, the lowest life expectancy for a long time was for um, Black Americans um, and people who are Black living in all parts of the US. Um, and in recent years, it's been quite um, sort of trading off um, between Native Americans and Black Americans in terms of having the shortest lives. So I think that both are attributed to the social germans of health, the history of you know genocide, land theft, um, racism and all kinds of um, stressful, disempowering and marginalized experiences that these groups um, were put through. And so unfortunately, it ref it's reflected today um, in, in shorter lives, in shorter lives, yeah. Um, someone has to ask, will both reports include um, the data um, as in the portrait of Sonoma County? And yes, uh, they will. And again, you'll also be able to download the data if you want and to map the data onto a, a little map uh, tool that we have on the website. And bring the data, we'll have it. Okay. So I think I've answered the questions in the hopper here. If anybody has any others. Oh. Yes, yes. So um, the question was, are prisoners, are people living in group quarters included in the data? And they are. Yes, they are. Great. Um, so Alex, should I turn it back to you to introduce the panelists? Okay, so Alex is going to introduce the panelists. And we are looking forward to hearing uh, people's reactions and what they have to say. Thank you. 
Thanks, Kristen, and uh, thank you, everyone. Um, so we now have a panel discussion for you. A big thank you to all the panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules to prepare and share their expertise during this discussion. Uh, today, we're joined by Lisa Howard, who works as a multi-tier systems of support MTSS coordinator at the Del Norte County Unified School District, which is a nationally recognized school district that passionately teaches 4,000 students across 11 schools located in Del Norte County. Aubrey Richardson is a, a planner slash data analyst at the Northern California Indian Development Council Incorporated, NCIDC. NCIDC is a regional nonprofit and tribal coalition serving American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian people in Humboldt, Del Norte, Siskiyou, and Trinity County, as well as across the state. Michelle Rich is the Director of Community Impact for the Community Foundation of Mendocino County. Michelle oversees the Community Foundation's grants, community leadership projects, and other special projects. Thank you, Lisa, Aubrey, and Michelle. So um, I just, everyone's on, great. Uh, so panelists, um, thank you again. Uh, our discussion will focus on what it takes to advance equity and improve well-being for all residents in Del Norte and Mendocino counties. To start the conversation, I'll provide panelists questions, but I encourage all participants to submit their questions for the panelists in the Q&A box during the, during the discussion. Um, so now, uh, everyone, I invite you to weigh in on this first question. What are the implications of this report and what you've seen so far on your work? Well, thank you so much for having me. And I'm coming to you from the ancestral lands of the Yurok and Tolua Dene, as well as Elk Valley and Rezagini Rancheria. Um, I'd also like to recognize that we serve students through Title VI through 47 different tribal entities here in our school system. It is extremely important for us to incorporate this data in the work and the planning that we're doing. And we have been very much um, fortunate to have the Yurok tribe receive the Klamath Promised Neighborhoods Grant. We have received a, a slew of mental health and wellness grants here at Del Norte County Office of Education, as well as the Community Schools Planning Grant. And now in combined effort, we are using this data collectively to address problems. So we have tribes at the table, we have agencies at the table, we have not just schools, but stakeholders, members of our community and neighborhoods and parents. And for us, it's really important for us to do the deep dive on data as you have done for us to indicate which areas within Del Norte County we should concentrate and target those resources and pay attention to so that we can increase our equity and access. Uh, our mantra is multi-tiered system of support is our delivery model. And for us, it's really important that those who need get what they, they need um, in a timely fashion. And so we have a whole child mantra that is not just educational achievement indicators, but also the wellness piece of how the whole child comes to us. And so whole family is now included in that as well. And so I can see us incorporating all of these data points as uh, a way to focus our efforts and deliver equity and access to our peoples here. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I'll go ahead and dive in. Um, <clears throat> so at, at the foundation, you know, the report really um, supports the quali qualitative data we've collected during our recent strategic planning process and really um, supports the work we've started and are going to continue to do to move from more equal grant, grant making to equitable grant making. So we've always tried to make sure everyone was included and at the table as best we could. And I think, you know, the data really speaks to how um, not everyone comes to the table with the same resources. And so it's not just about bringing people there, but making sure that everyone has what they need to get to the table to begin with. And so, um, having the data support that I think is really key in helping our board understand why that's important. And, um, you know, I think it will continue to help us monitor how changes we might make um, can affect populations um, 
in our programming. So. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I would say for NCADC, um, it's it's further evidence of how resilient Indigenous people are um, after having gone through so much and yet continuing to improve in their well-being. Um, but the report shows that there's still more work to be done. So. Um, it's you know good news and, and just another challenge to rise to. Um, the the second thing is that many of the notes in the report stated that data on Native American people is not reliable, which is also something that we have encountered and been aware of for quite a while. Um, so it's just another a uh, reason for local communities, um, our agency and others to continue making efforts to collect our own data and research and communicate at the local level with our with our people to understand um, Native American needs because it's just not being well documented at this time. Thank you. Um, so now I'd like to ask everyone to, to weigh in on this next question. So, for, um, so the ongoing COVID pandemic, as well as this most recent extreme weather severely impacted the physical economic health of thousands of residents. This report identified several areas for investment and action uh, designed to close the gaps in standard of living, increasing economic security for low income workers, improving population health and reducing health equity inequity and making educational equity a reality, just to, to name a few. Could you please pick one of your recommendations or interventions from this report and tell us what you need, uh, what, what you think needs to happen to really move the needle on that issue? I'll go ahead and start with this one. Um, so as I looked at the recommendations for Mendocino County, the one that to me stood out as having the most widespread and immediate impact is actually high-speed broadband internet. Um, many of the recommendations, uh, well, absolutely appropriate and spot on are also very complex social um, problems. And that takes uh, concentrated time and effort to untangle. And what I appreciate about broadband as a recommendation is that it's something we could actually do something about now and make immediate impact on education, economy, and um, you know health through telehealth services. Um, the foundation has been working on this issue since 2007, so we've kind of been pushing for it for a long while. Um, and the exciting thing is that there actually are now dollars available for the infrastructure to do it. So I think we're really on the cusp of actually making broadband for Mendocino County residents um, across our geographic spectrum um, a more realistic reality. And I think that would really be game changing for a lot of communities. Thank you, Michelle. That's something we've heard echoed um, in our conversations in the San Joaquin Valley and, and rural Virginia too. Um, for Del Norte County, we have had broadband for the last, I don't know, five or 10 years now. Um, and we have been lucky to have early investment on that. We're one of the few rural communities that that really pushed for that to be connected. And um, so building off of that, as well as all of the um, uh, financial resources that are available at this moment, um, when you know all of us have targeted resources at that at that top you know recommendation. And what I foresee is that what we need to have is a, a summit that includes a needs assessment, communal needs assessment to prioritize and show this data as part of how to focus that lens, make sure all of the arrows are pointed in the same direction to actually address the needs that are being identified within the report here and other data points that we have within our community. Now is the time to take those resources because I suspect there will be very few times in the next few years where we 
can say we are flush with money to do something about what we are seeing as health and wellness el- uh, outcomes for our community. So um, for us, we're really talking about, you know, regular planning meetings and it's begun uh, somewhat under the Klamath Promise Neighborhoods Grant, thankfully, to bring in a lot of groups to talk about how to improve outcomes for Native Americans within all of Del Norte County, because that grant that grant provides for not just the Yurok tribe in Klamath, but also for Smith River community where the Tolawa Dene are at and throughout the county. So um, you know, now is that moment to have really robust conversations using these data points and to focus those efforts. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate you uh, bringing up uh, planning and, and coordination. That is what I was going to focus on. Um, I, and I think it, it it weaves through a lot of the recommendations um, targeting resources to the most vulnerable populations. Um, I think active efforts um, from all of us to educate our community, both agencies, governments, and community members about um, systemic inequities and what that creates, um, in addition to like the current um, inequities we're experiencing, the actual data, and then um, each of us intentionally and actively working to um, combat that by putting in more effort uh, to reach those vulnerable populations and not expecting them to come to us, but uh, making many and large efforts to make sure that they're included regardless, um, I think is, is a big, uh, it's, I think many people are working towards it. I think we should continue and make greater efforts to do that going forward. Um, in addition to that, I think like a, a smaller, um, more specific point would be increasing data collection um, on various, not just ethnicities, but uh, um, different demographics um, at every level so that each of us can understand the people that we're serving, um, coordinate, make sure that they get the resources and information that they need and that we can share that information between each other and grow as communities. Thank you, Aubrey. So Aubrey, my next question is for you. Um, how can we use this research and data to accelerate or foster dialogue about advancing racial equity and systems and policies to address the inequities highlighted in the report? So I found this to be a little bit of a tough question, but uh, my thought was that this report and any report of this kind, their starting places, um, those of us who provide various human services um, need this data to obtain and fight for more funding to provide those services. But our current and our future work is also to point to and highlight this data uh, for others. Um, in community networks, in, in government meetings, uh, foundations. Um, so I think we all need to work to foster, like I was saying earlier, foster understanding of uh, the systemic causes of inequity across the community, um, across different um, silos, trying to reduce silos across different areas when people might not think the information is relevant to them, but in fact, all of it's interconnected. Um, like I said, influencing funding allocations, um, motivating internal examinations on what more can be done to address inequities in each of our work. I think that this is, um, this can be inspirational information to um, inspire that kind of inter inspection. Um, 
Really, uh, we just want to make sure, I think we want to make sure this information is seen and used for change. Thank you, Aubrey. Um, my next question is for Michelle. From your experience, could you provide uh, some examples of groups or institutions that need to work more closely together to gain traction and change inequities in uh, HDI, Human Development Index, outcomes? So that's a little bit of a tricky question. Um, I think that one of the advantages it, of having small, small insular communities is that people really do work closely together to make a difference in their communities. Um, <clears throat> and the challenge with that is sort of twofold. One is they often don't have the resources to be able to meet the needs adequately. Um, and two, uh, if you have been uh, historically marginalized in that community, it's really hard to get in on um, that kind of community support. And so, you know, certainly I think more regional collaboration to bring down state and federal dollars can help um, strengthen these local um, organizations and community partnerships that are happening. Um, but I actually think it, it takes a little bit of out of the box thinking to really um, make a difference in the inequities in the community in terms of connecting with historically marginalized groups. Um, you know, I think it's really easy to say that government or educational systems should work more closely with tribes or engage better or differently with the Latino community. And those would all be helpful. But I think what it comes down to is, you know, our understanding of human experience and human stories and how we connect to and relate to each other and understand people's experiences. And that doesn't actually, it, improved understanding of people doesn't actually come through human services. It comes through forms like art or cultural expression. Um, and so I actually think that ways that we can strengthen and support our art and cultural communities to help tell stories will actually really move the needle on inequity because people will understand each other better. They'll have more frame of reference for bringing people into the conversation. They'll want to be more inclusive because they actually understand what people are going through in a really meaningful way. And I think a good example of that is um, the exhibit that's at the Grace Hudson Museum. I think it's still up right now, um, but they worked with uh, local Native um, arts collaboratives at, to capture pandemic related artwork and how the Native American communities continue to support each other in their traditional uh, practices of regalia making and basketry um, through that. And I think it it was a lovely way of presenting a different side of the impact of, of COVID in a community that was really healing and also for the general public offered a way into that community that isn't just the, the, the stories they may have or the perceptions they may have of what it means to to live in, you know, for example, Round Valley or um, on one of the, the reservations. So um, that gives me a lot of hope. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, now I'd like to invite everyone to, to weigh in on this uh, final question. So if we're thinking collectively about a vision for Del Norte County and Mendocino County, if the recommendations in this report do, were to be implemented, what are uh, two or three things that would be different or better and different and better for residents, especially for those that are struggling right now? So in Del Norte County, um, I think it's twofold for us. And it is around the idea of increased understanding by all communal members. We tend to live in silos of agencies and services, and often, as was mentioned before, maybe not as connected as we could be to the people we are trying to serve. In that, those who are within these agencies and services, such as educators that I come from, um, increasing the knowledge of local peoples is one of our focal points now because we realize that we do have a lot of new employees within our system, people always moving into Del Norte County that do not understand the past history and cultures that reside here. So that piece of it is super important. The other part is multifaceted around understanding of resources that are available. 
oftentimes you'll hear people say, we do not have mental health resources. What they mean to say is, I do not know where to find mental health resources in my community, right? Or food resources. We have lots of uh, indicators and, and struggles that we will have to improve, but part of that may be increasing the understanding of where they can be found. We have multiple food deserts within Del Norte County. Then what we look at is, how do I have access to the resources that provide fresh fruits and vegetables within our community? And how can we expand that? So that then becomes that coordination piece that Aubrey mentioned earlier. It is super important that we start with people's knowledge of the system that we are living in and work so that everyone can, whether it's a small child or an elder, find what they are looking for when they need it and who to ask. Um, so uh, the understanding of who we are as a people in Del Norte, and then the understanding of where to find those resources, super important for us. Thank you, Lisa. I think if we implemented the recommendations in this report. I mean, I think it's it's an it's more of a road than a final goal. I think we'll always be working to implement these things. Um, but I hope that it would result in fewer at-risk young people, which would eventually lead to just generally greater prosperity. Um, which like Lisa was saying, you know, Del Nor is working with promised neighborhoods uh, to really um, improve the, the path to prosperity for young people. Um, I, I think that working on all of these things together will create a system that works for our youth um, and gives them the support that they need to find the life that they want to live while also being able to um, cover their needs. Uh, that, that's my, my hope. Thank you, Aubrey. Yeah, <clears throat> and I would just echo uh, Aubrey and thinking about the, the young adults who would benefit from these recommendations, the high levels of disengaged um, transition age youth is really concerning. And I think many of the recommendations focus on improving the quality of life for um, children and families, and that will pay forward enormously. Um, having young adults who are better able to enter the workplace with desirable soft skills, better emotional regulation and self-care skills, having you know more financial security and housing stability, to help mitigate some of the toxic stress that just comes with, um, you know, being part of disadvantaged communities, um, I think it would have really huge long-term outcomes um, or impact on health outcomes um, and ultimately life expectancy. Thank you, Michelle. So um, that concludes the formal structure of the panelist uh, questions. If anyone um, in the audience has, uh, you know, questions to, that they'd like to direct to the panelists, please go ahead and ask them. Um, you can, you know, ask that you think about how uh, you might want to build on the examples our panelists have mentioned. Um, and yeah, what that's just been discussed. Um, what kind of questions does that raise or opportunities does it uh, make you think of? So if you could just put them in the Q&A, um, we'll relay them to the, to the panelists. All right, there's uh, one question. Do you have suggestions for practical next steps and how can we support each other in taking these next steps? Actually, while you're thinking about that, there was another question that came in is, uh, will we be able to send the recording of today's launch to everyone? And the answer is yes. 
um, check back in a day or two and we'll uh, post it on our website, that link that we just sent earlier. And we will also be able to send one out to everyone who um, attended here. I would encourage those looking for next steps to pick up the phone, make the call, connect with that group that you've been meaning to or would like to, and have a, a point person that makes a lot of meetings for your key central um, people in power who make decisions, um, especially regarding the resources available to each entity and bring people together. You cannot have enough opportunities to bring people to the table and have the conversations and start big and then go to small subgroups and do the work. You know, uh, We would often have facilitated meetings um, in the past through building healthy communities where 200 people would come together at Elk Valley Rancheria and have discussions about what this community needed. And that's how we prioritize zero to five and early literacy is that the community said, what is one of the best investments we can make in our community and how can we help? And so it was amazing to find employers from across all the spectrum, as well as local neighbors and friends showing up to the table to have rich conversation about how they might also be able to help move the needle for uh, early education and literacy. And a lot of folks ask our County Office of Ed, well, how did you make those meetings? What did you do? Well, we knock doors, we go to offices, we make phone calls and outreach emails to people we don't know regularly. We absolutely take the initiative to forge new relationships or renew relationships that could be very productive for our future. Thank you, Lisa. Anyone else want to weigh in on that one? Yeah, you know, I think that um, one of the things to consider is that with the effects of the pandemic and isolation and just the stress that that has placed on um, our social service systems, there's a lot of burnout. And I think that makes it hard to think about how coming together to plan for the future in, in some ways, um, because you're just, I, I think everyone I've talked to in, in my circles, it's like, we're just feeling it. It's been a really heavy couple of years um, and we continue to have ongoing disasters and all of these things. And so I think that, you know, part of the next steps also involves some some healing and self-reflection and you know i think that does actually come through relationship in a lot of ways so i really appreciated lisa's suggestion um you know i think it some people i i will speak for myself you know got out of the routine of meeting with people regularly you know it's been exciting to have those opportunities in this last year and it's not even large groups it's those one-on-one -on -one conversations that can help move the next project forward so um I, that's where I, I would start um, as a, a, to move forward. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I would also, um, I agree with both Lisa and Michelle. Um, and I see also um, uh, Lisa Carreño posted in the chat um, that we have to start with the intention of using the data. And I, I completely agree. And that's something that can be um, done by everyone, whether you're just uh, coming as a community member or as someone working in a business or at an agency is to understand that information and then participate, just like start um, participating in uh, local meetings, local government meetings, um, networks, things like that, and bring it up, ask, ask questions about the things that come up. I think that's uh, one of the best things that, that we can always do is to ask questions, both of ourselves and of others, about um, what more we can do to start addressing these things in every way. Thank you, Aubrey. And um... I just want to read out what Lisa Carreño wrote in the chat. Um, she said, I'm unable to type a question in the chat uh, that would go out to everyone. So here's a reflection based on the portrait of Sonoma County launch in 2014. Many, many nonprofit and many government managers and leaders began to use the portrait 
as the basis for presentations to raise awareness and understanding about the context within which we are all wrong. This led to conversations about data, what it means, what policy and resource changes will change the HDI, et cetera. This data is the basis for generations worth of community engagement and building work ahead. Um, thank you for writing that. It was uh, working. Um, the word data were working uh, about, sorry, um, understanding about the context within which we were all working. Uh, that's what the, the portrait helped frame. So um, thank you for that, Lisa. I, I mean, I worked on that report back in 2013, 14, and it's, I'm continually really struck by the difference it seems to have made. So thank you. Um, and I, I hope this is useful and uh, in Del Norton, Mendocino as well. Um, and there's one final question from um, me to the panelists. The prompt is, uh, what is one thing, uh, in two minutes or less, that you hope our webinar participants take away as a result of this session? Um, so I would say that uh, cultural and experiential considerations can and should be made at all levels. Um, I, I really liked the examples in the report of like coroners um, not allow, not being able to mark two or more races as something that can uh, potentially be improved on. And also the example of the Yurok language classes being implemented in schools. Um, there's, there's many things that you can do in uh, different businesses and agencies um, to create a more welcoming and supportive environment for all people. Thank you, Aubrey. I think I would want to just, uh, I, I hope people take away, you know, not just that it's um, difficult data and there's a lot of issues to overcome, but that there's also been some wins. And I think for me, the way this report actually called out the um, social justice inequities in addition to the data is really a, a, a key step forward um, in terms of just naming, you know, the, the one of the root causes of um, our health inequities. And um, I think that's important to consider. I think it's important to, to take the wins when we have them. There's been a lot of great work in Mendocino on housing in particular. So yes, it still needs a lot of work, but you know, we're building stuff and that's great. Um, you know, we might not have a lot of people going to college, but we do have a lot of students graduating from high school and that is great. So I think, you know, there's ways to, to pick on the things that are working to find find hope for how we can leverage those into um, better outcomes in the future too. Thank you, Michelle. And I know at least for Del Norte County Office of Education and those of our partners that we work with that, you know, this is a starting place. We can now clearly see the data and the health outcomes of the people that we are trying to serve within our community. And it's a really just a starting place to move up from here. And I think that uh, digging in and realizing that this data has names and these names are what we need to find and address and to make an effort to focus the efforts of of these entities and resources towards improving the outcomes in prevention and early intervention services, moving upstream in our efforts so that we aren't working out of crisis mode and will continually, as Michelle had mentioned, you know, make that early investment uh, in our youth so that we can adjust how our community is thriving in our future. So it's very exciting. The data is, is going to be terrific um, discussion points for all future meetings to be assured. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and thank you so much, uh, Lisa again, Aubrey, Michelle, for taking your time to uh, present today and uh, to be on our panel and to prepare for it and also for the role you played in shaping this. Um, I'd like to turn it back over to Kristen to uh, conclude our session today. Great. 
Uh, thank you so much, Alex. Um, I am trying. I'm trying to rejoin you on video. For some reason, it's not working. Um, but that's all right. I, I'll just talk. <laughs> Uh, so again, just to uh, join Alex in thanking um, those who made introductory remarks and um, our panelists, we're so grateful for um, the time you took to prepare and the guidance you've provided along the way. Um, I also just wanted to express our sincere wishes that you are all um, okay. We know the weather has been insane there. So I hope that, you know, that none of you is experiencing um, any insurmountable sort of challenges right now. Um, and yeah, so I just wanted to close by saying that we are here for you. If you need uh, presentations, if you uh, want the PowerPoint, if you have any questions about the data that we can help you answer um, or if you need more or you're, you have questions about how to use it or, or basically anything, um, we want our reports to make a difference. And if we can help make that happen, uh, please let us know. So um, just to thank my colleagues uh, for all of their hard work on this report. And um, that's it. I'll just, uh, and, and Vicki for all of her, her work in organizing, uh, well, so many things, but including this, <laughs> including this panel. Um, and that's it for us. So thank you so much for participating today. And we look forward to being in touch in the future. Thanks.